Hello and welcome back to Pegasus Rocketry. My name is Mason and we're starting the next build off the build pile. This one's coming from the Black Friday special from Wildman Rocketry. It's the three inch shapeshifter. Let's start by looking at the components. We have a five inch coupler, a 14 and a half inch nose cone and one bulk plate. And now for the electronics bay, we have a one inch switch band and a seven inch bay followed by two stepped av bay closures. And for the motor, we have a 54 millimeter by 11 inch motor mount tube and two 54 millimeter to 75 millimeter centering rings. We have three pre-beveled fins and a 22 inch payload tube. And last but not least, we have a 44 inch booster tube pre-slotted. Now I'll slide the AeroPack motor retainer over the motor mount tube and mark it with a Sharpie to know how far I need to sand. Now I put the centering rings on the motor mount tube and put them in place using the slotted airframe as a guide to make sure that my centering rings are above and below the fin slots. And then I use a Sharpie and mark their position to know where to sand. And now I use a die grinder with some medium surface prep pads to prep the fiberglass for epoxy. I'm doing this in a well ventilated area outdoors so that I'm not uh, accumulating some toxic dust inside. Now that we have the motor mount tube and the centering rings prepped, let's get it epoxied. Okay, let's go ahead and work on the motor mount. We've got it put together, ready to epoxy. We're just double checking that we've got room to put the motor retainer on. We've got room for a fillet on both sides of this centering ring and this forward centering ring is placed far enough forward that we will not be overlapping with the fins when they come through so everything is looking good we've got our shock cord running through we'll epoxy that in place as well to secure it and it is long enough that it will protrude out the front of the rocket so that we can secure the parachute so Let's get started. We're using a new epoxy to me. We're using the West Systems 610. This is my first time using it, so we'll see how that works. It's a thickened epoxy that you use a caulk gun to apply. It's got the self uh, mixing applicators. So it should be squeeze and go and no mixing required. So we'll give that a shot, see how it works. Okay, let's give this a try, see how it works. Just take moderate force to extrude. Okay. And we're back. The epoxy is cured. We are ready to dry fit this and see if we fit and are set. Okay. Ah, oh, there we go. Yeah, we will be set. Everything's fitting. Yep. That's perfect. Okay, so this is ready to go. 
Okay, and as you can see, we've got no epoxy in the slots, nothing. The centering rings are not hitting the slots. We've got no epoxy overlap, so we should be good. Now we're going to sand the inner edge of the booster so that we get good adhesion with the epoxy. Now that the motor mount is cured, we have inserted it and made sure uh, to dry fit with all the fins to make sure that they do insert in every slot with no interference so we don't end up with a major mistake later. So now we're going to secure it in place by applying some epoxy around that bottom um, centering ring. Okay, now we've got some epoxy. Let's go ahead and start dumping it in. Okay, now I'm going to take my motor retainer and we'll apply a little bit of epoxy inside. And here I'm using more West Systems epoxy thickened with colloidal silica and applying epoxy to the motor mount and the retainer, just making sure it's a fully moist joint so that it stays put. Using a 16 gauge applicator, I'm applying more of the thickened West Systems, thickened to the point that it'll still self level, but thick enough that it won't seep through the cracks. Now I'm using a small drill bit, just large enough for my applicator, about a half inch above my centering ring so that I can inject the epoxy from above without it dripping down the sidewalls. This epoxy is unthickened, so it will self-level easily. We've already sealed it with the thickened epoxy on the other side of the centering ring. We're letting the epoxy cure, it's time to attach the fins. So we'll go back to the die grinder and prep the surfaces. Again, I'm using a medium surface prep pad. Precision isn't super important. You just want to make sure you're long enough to cover the length of the fin. At this point, I am loving my die grinder with the surface prep pad. If you've sanded one of these before, you realize they are super hard and your hand starts to cramp up super quick. To keep my fins aligned during assembly, I'm going to use a 3D printed alignment guide. I'm going to use a little dab of super glue to secure the fins while I epoxy them in place. I use masking tape to ensure that I get nice clean lines. The keen eye of you may notice that I didn't put any epoxy on the root, and that's because I'm building this more like a minimum diameter rocket, and that is, in case of the event that I break a fin, it will be much easier to replace in this case. And I'm using much thicker fillets than I typically would if I were using the traditional through the wall fin can design. And we're going back to the West 610 for the fin attachment. And at this point, I am loving how smooth it is. It is a dream to work with. After waiting about 30 to 45 minutes for it to start to cure, but not harden all the way, you want it still malleable. I start to remove all the tape and then we will use a gloved finger dipped in some denatured alcohol to help smooth the edges from where the seam of the tape was to get it smooth with the surface of the fin. Now I'll cut my two rods a quarter 20 ohm thread for the electronics bay. Now let's drill a quarter inch hole for a quarter inch bolt in the closure for the nose cone. Now for the electronics bay closures, let's drill three quarter inch holes, one for the eye bolt and two for the all thread. I'm only showing one here, rinse and repeat for the second. Now let's assemble the av bay lids and the bulkhead for the nose cone. I'm using quarter 20 bolts and forged eye nuts for attachment points for the shock cords. I'm using blue Loctite on all the threads to ensure they don't come loose during flight. 
Now let's get started on the electronics bay. I'm taking the coupler and centering the switch band and marking both sides of it with a sharpie to know where to sand to attach it. Instead of using the die grinder, this time I'm using my hand. I'm using effectively the same material, a medium scotch bright pad. I sand both the coupler and the switch band. And afterwards I use denatured alcohol to clean the dust off of both surfaces. Guess what time it is! Time for more sanding. This time, the coupler for the nose cone. Have you gotten enough sanding in yet? Ah, so has my wrist, but there's still more to go. We still have to sand the inside of the nose cone. Finally, the sanding is complete. Now we can secure the switch band to the electronics bay. I'm using some more thickened West Systems epoxy and a syringe with a 16 gauge applicator. Now I'm using a large sponge applicator soaked in denatured alcohol to remove any of the excess and leave a nice clean finish. Now it's time to secure the end closure for the nose cone. I'm using more thickened West Systems epoxy. Uh, if I were to do this again, I would put it a little further into the coupler so that the shear pin could be on this side of the coupler so that the pieces fall out instead of trapped inside the nose cone for eternity. And some more thickened epoxy to secure the bulkhead on the inside of the coupler and as well as securing the bolt from the inside so it does not come loose. After giving it time for the epoxy to cure, it's time to secure it into the nose cone. I'm using more thickened epoxy and a dry sponge applicator to soak the outside of the coupler in epoxy as well as soaking the inside of the nose cone in epoxy and just start swirling it around as inserting it to ensure a nice even coating. Let's drill a hole for a shear pin and I'm going to tap it as well. I'm only using one shear pin to hold the nose cone in place. In addition to the hole for the shear pin, I'm adding a second hole to vent the payload section so it makes it easier to assemble. It does this by preventing pressurization of the payload bay. I use my guide to mark three evenly spaced holes for the venting for the electronics bay. I used an online calculator to figure out how big my drill bit needs to be. And I always err on the side larger rather than smaller for safety. Here I'm using a light to determine where my electronics bay ends. And I'm using a laser aligned with the rear rail button to ensure everything's in a straight line. The left hole that I'm currently drilling is for the forward rail button. I'm using some needle nose pliers to align the weld nut from the inside while I secure the rail button. Now let's drill and tap the hole for the shear pin that attaches the electronics bay to the booster. I am using just a single number two shear pin to secure the electronics bay to the booster tube. Now we need to make an attachment point for the electronics bay to the payload section that remains secure during the flight. I have used push rivets before on other rockets. They are a little loose, so we're trying something new. I insert the screw after drilling the first hole so that when I drill the second, both holes are perfectly aligned. I'm going to epoxy weld nuts into the inside of the electronics bay that I can secure with number four screws. Right now I am securing the first weld nut in place with the number four screw, tightening it down so that it gets the curve of the coupler as well as holds it in place while I apply the epoxy. To secure the weld nuts, I'm using thickened West Systems epoxy. Here I'm showing one rinse and repeat for the second weld nut. And we still have the rear rail button left. I'm going to try something new for me. I'm going to use a riv nut and this will give me a solid set of threads to screw a rail button into. I'm using a special tool to apply the riv nut, which expands the riv nut into the backside of the fiberglass, securing it in place. Well, doesn't that look perfect? Now let's move back over to the electronics bay. I'm trying something a little different. I am going to use two number four screws to pass through the pyro connections. 
This will help keep the electronics bay sealed up from the pressure from the black powder going off. And on the inside of the electronics bay attached to the lids, I will have some JST RCY plugs attached to each of the ab bay lids. This will let me quickly connect and disconnect the ab bay lids to the flight computers for ease of access, swapping batteries. And now I'm crimping ring terminals to attach the wires to the screws. I prefer to use ratcheting crimpers to ensure that I have a solid connection every time. The ratchet does not release until you get a full crimp. Be sure to use different gender connectors for each of the ab bay lids so you don't accidentally cross your wires and put out your main when you intend to put out your drogue. I'm using two flat washers that I will sandwich the E-match wire between to ensure a good electrical connection. I'm also using a lock washer to ensure that even through the vibration there is constant force applied to ensure that the E-match wire is firmly secured. And this is how I made the first av bay lid, rinse and repeat for the second. And that's anything unique to this build. All we need to do is put a flight computer on a sled and we're ready to go. I'm not showing that because the video would be too long. Let's get to the exciting stuff, the 10 p.m. night before the launch ground testing. Let's start with two grams on the drogue. There was still plenty of shock cord left in the tube, so we'll bump it up to three grams for the flight. Okay, let's move on to the main at two grams. Okay, that worked well. There could be a little bit more enthusiasm, so for the flight, we'll bump that up to three grams as well. Now let's send it off on its maiden flight with an Aerotech J350. 